Hi, my name is Anami. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. Today, I want to talk to you about InnoSource at Microsoft. Just to recap, Microsoft has about 189,000 employees worldwide, where 50% uh, are fulfilling engineering roles. Microsoft have been changing a lot over time, and specifically in the last about five years, Microsoft put a lot of emphasis on diversity and inclusion, which really helps from a cultural perspective for inner source and open source initiatives. Microsoft sees about 1.5 million PRs every single quarter. And to see more details about how Microsoft looks at InnoSource, please look at my uh, recording from last year at the InnoSource Fall event. Now, switching gears a little bit, where does the InnoSource initiative live in Microsoft? Um, we are part of the Open Source Programs Office. And the Open Source Programs Office was founded in 2014 at Microsoft. In 2018, the InnoSource initiative was founded outside of OSPO, and then in 2019, we joined the OSPO, as it makes a lot of sense from a cultural alignment to handle those two topics together. However, keep in mind, those two topics are still separate topics in the sense that InnoSource has aspects that open source doesn't, and the other way around. So I encourage you strongly to look at those things as two separate but aligned topics. As far as the role of the InnoSource initiative in Microsoft is concerned, uh, we are uh, providing insights uh, for teams in Microsoft in respect to InnoSource. We provide subject matter expertise, how to collaborate more efficiently, and we provide data that people can use to understand where they are and where they maybe should put some emphasis in respect to InnoSource. In respect to that, we also created just recently a state of the inner source at Microsoft report. And today I want to talk a little bit about that report and the findings that we have within that report. Let's start out with the projects. I want to make sure you understand that every project is different. Projects are as individual as people are. And so every project has a different level of potential uh, as far as inner source is concerned. Successful inner source projects at Microsoft typically range from 15 to 35% uh, external PRs, meaning inner source PRs. Um, and you can't say 50% is bad and 35% is good, but rather that is the potential of the individual projects and you need to take that into account. The second thing I wanna talk a little bit about is behaviors that actually influence the success of inner source. And, I want to basically talk about two different type of behaviors. There are what I want to call cultural behaviors, and then there are measurable behaviors. And I start out with the cultural behaviors. Cultural behaviors are really uh, the three things that I mentioned here. And essentially, you have to be intentional about inner source. That means the team that pursues inner source needs to be all in in respect to inner source. Inner source is not something you can do just as an addition. You need to be very intentional. You have to have planning for inner source because there is some overhead and there are some behaviors that you need to put in place in order to be successful. One of those things is also repo documentation. Successful inner source projects have excellent repo documentation that is to the point and that is elaborate enough that people understand not only the technical components of your solution, but also the intention of the project. Finding the right project to engage with is a little bit like matchmaking between people, and there are many, many aspects you need to take into account. The third is communication. When you have a project and you want to collaborate in inner source, you want to make sure that you collaborate and communicate openly. You need to make sure that you have a communication plan. And again, successful projects in Microsoft actually do have a communication plan in place. Next, I'm going to talk about measurable behaviors. And there are really three things, and they all roll up to response times. When you look at PRs, basically PR is the quintessence of collaboration as far as development is concerned. And you want to make sure that your PR times are reasonably short. A typical median response time of less than an hour is something I would strongly recommend to have. When you look at inner source, you need to make sure, though, that your internal PRs and your external incoming PRs have about the same PR response times. It comes down to the experience that a collaborator has with your project. And if the PR response time is very, very slow, then it doesn't seem like 
the contribution is actually uh, wanted. Next up, PR description. And that was kind of a bummer. We thought, well, PR description is pretty straightforward. If there is a description of what the PR is about, um, then people know what it is and it will increase the PR velocity. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. PR description is something that is handled by every team differently. And what it means as a collaborator, you need to understand how the team is handling certain aspects of the PR. In some cases, a PR description helps to drive PR velocity. In other cases, it doesn't. So make sure before you engage that you understand the culture of the team you're engaging with. That doesn't mean PR descriptions are not important. It just means for PR velocity, there is no rule you can apply in general. Next is the PR size. In respect to PR size, it's pretty obvious smaller PRs are easier to consume. However, what we found is they're not only easier to consume, but also the time to first respond to an open PR is significantly different depending on the PR size. So as a collaborator, you can make sure by right-sizing your PR to be more successful in respect to innocence. And as the maintaining team, you can do a lot for your own PR velocity by also making sure you emphasize the PR size as one thing uh, you pursue. Specifically, it will help you to make sure that a single PR addresses only a single issue. Uh, we, have provide, we are providing a tool that's called the pull request quantifier, which we use in this investigation as well. It's publicly available on GitHub. So I encourage you to have a look at there and install it potentially in your repositories. Last, I wanna talk about organizational metrics. And here, make sure that the metrics that you provide are consistent, actionable, and relevant. So what do I mean by consistent? Consistent means not only that you provide the raw data about, for example, the PRs, but also provide a way to, to have a consistent interpretation of the data. And you can do that by doing two things. Number one is provide, for example, database procedures or functions that provide the insight that you're trying to convey. The second one is provide dashboards and thus also provide a consistent view on the data for teams so they can compare each other and uh, improve. The second aspect is to be actionable. And this is really, really important. Engineering teams are very, very focused and you need to provide metrics in order to influence their behavior that they can actually work on, right? So make sure the data that you provide is actionable. The feedback that you provide is actionable. And last but not least, make sure it is relevant. And by relevant, I mean any data that you surface needs to answer an engineering question or an engineering problem. Make sure you really, really focus on that because that influences the success of teams within your company. Now, from a Microsoft perspective, does InnoSource move the needle? Well, as you can see here in this graph, which depicts the participation of people in InnoSource projects uh, at Microsoft, yes, it does. And we have been increasing this through two things. Fundamentally, Microsoft has changed culturally. And secondly, we have an InnoSource initiative which really helps people to pick up the ball and run with InnoSource. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.